Division of Maternal and Child Health. Um, Ms. Ferguson joined the Department of Public Health in 2016 as a principal investigator for the Kentucky Sewage Case Registry Grant. She also manages the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring Grant and the Safe Sleep Campaign in Kentucky. She has over 20 years of experience in child welfare, and she's worked for the Commonwealth of Kentucky since 1995 in various capacities, including roles as a statewide trainer, branch manager, and assistant director for the DCBS Division of Protection and Permanency. So without further ado, thank you so much uh, for being with us this morning, and it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Doc. Um, so I will jump right in so we can um, stay on track today. I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you all about sudden unexpected infant death, and I'm really excited to let you know what we're learning and help um, spark some discussion about what we can do. So we'll start out with some definitions and prevalence. Um, over the last 60 years, several terms have been used for sudden infant death. Um, this was confusing not only to parents, but also to professionals and researchers. So in 2006, the CDC suggested a broad term that would encompass all sudden deaths um, and an emphasis was placed on sudden and unexpected. Sudden meaning the death comes without warning and unexpected meaning that no pre-existing condition could have predicted it. Um, there are some conditions that have to be met for cases to fall under this category. Um, in addition to being sudden and unexpected. And those are that this occurs in the first um, year of life. So the infant has not turned um, one year of age and that all other conditions have been excluded after a complete autopsy, a thorough scene investigation and, re and a review of the infant's clinical history. Um, this includes undetermined causes, SIDS, and accidental suffocation, suffocation and strangulation in bed. So if we were to map that out of all the ways that an infant can die suddenly and unexpectedly, we have those that are unexplained, which are the SIDS and the undetermined cases. And then we have the explained of which um, accidental suffocation falls um, under for our sewage case registry. As you all know, Infant mortality is seen as the best indicator of a state's overall health. That being said, Kentucky's current rate is twice the national average, and SUID is the second leading cause of death just behind prematurity-related conditions. This is how Kentucky ranks. Um, if we look at the map from of cases across the United States from 2013 to 2017, Kentucky is in that dark blue um, category. And um, as of this um, publication, which was the systems mortality files last year, we were rated, we were ranked seventh with a rate of um, 156.8%. Um, and just to give you some context, uh, on average, about 3,600 infants die nationally um, by suet, from suet. Um, and these cases usually happen in the infant's sleep area, but we do have some cases in the registry of a witnessed unresponsive where an infant was um, alert and awake and then lost consciousness. Um, and those are usually related to threats to breathing. So to bring this down to from, from a national perspective down to a Kentucky um, look, this is our map of this of the time period between January 1st of 2016 through December 31st of 2018. Um, and this is how the cases distribute. Um, there are 243 cases included in this map. Um, and you can see in the pink color, um, those are counties that have had more than five sewage, five or more sewage cases in this time period. Um, and then it goes all the way down to the gray um, counties that aren't named, that haven't had any sewage cases. Um, you could expect that counties like um, Jefferson and Fayette or Boone and Kenton, even Pulaski and Christian and Hopkins would be in counties that would have more cases 
because they've got more infants and more residents. Um, I just want to highlight some outliers, however, that we found um, in our data. And basically those are counties with a population of less than 50,000. Um, because, you know, when we look at Jefferson County, there's 771,000 residents um, and Fayette County has 332,000 residents um, at the last uh, census that we had. So for these data, our outliers are Franklin County, Hopkins County and Henderson County all of which have less than 50,000 um, residents in those counties. So we know that those are counties where we need to do a little bit more work and education and a little bit more research into understanding what's going on with those counties. So let's talk a little bit about risk and prevention. Um, Work to understand why children die suddenly and unexpectedly has been going on for more than 60 years. The first um, objective analysis of cases was published in 1953 in the American Journal of Pathology. Um, in 1974, uh, we had the research was actually um, funded nationally for us to look at sudden unexpected infant death. In 1996, death scene protocols were um, established by the CDC. And then for Kentucky in 2015, we were granted our first um, case registry grant to actually fund the research into looking at why um, children die suddenly and unexpectedly. And in Kentucky, we um, use this triple risk model, which was first developed in 1994 and it does a really nice job of laying out the three pieces to this puzzle. And so you can see that the first piece is obviously a vulnerable infant there at the top. And things that are included in that category um, are an infant that is born prematurely. So before 37 weeks gestation, which um, 40 weeks is full term gestation. If the infant has had prenatal exposure to smoking and or alcohol, and I'll go into those um, statistics and risk factors a little bit deeper in a minute. And then we see an increase of risk for um, male infants. It also includes the, the critical period of development, which is most of the time between two and four months of age. Now, that being said, we have infants as young as five days old and all the way up to the oldest infant we have in our Kentucky registry is 10 months old. But the most of the cases, the majority of cases fall in between the two to four month age range. And then lastly, the outside stressors. And these are things that compound and make more difficult to overcome a vulnerable infant in a critical period of development. And those are um, infants that are placed in unsafe, un, unsafe sleep, uh, by unsafe sleep practices, sorry about that. Um, infants that have mild respiratory infections have an increased risk of SIDS. And then also smoke exposure has been shown, not just in Kentucky, but in the national literature to increase the risk of SUID. And so let's take a look at our cases um, from that same time period and see how those look. And again, um, there are 248 cases in this um, range that we're looking at right now. So of those in Kentucky, 26% were born prematurely. And this is the big ticket item that I really wish we could get down in Kentucky, but 67% of our infants were either um, exposed to cigarette smoke in the womb or um, in their home, um, and that could be the car, um, you know, the, the actual in the home um, after birth, but 67% seems like a really high number, um, and that's of our cases that of infants that die of suicide. 63% died before their fourth month of life. Um, and so that's true to what we see in the national data as well with that two to four month um, age range. And then um, the rest of the things in these modifiable risk factors are um, things that we're seeing in Kentucky. 
are 55% of the infants that died of suid between 2016 and 2018 um, were in a non-supine position, so either sleeping on their stomach or on their side. 78% um, had objects in the sleep area at the time of death, and those objects could be blankets, pillows, bumper pads, um, stuffed animals, anything soft and squishy um, that can mold to the infant's face and restrict their breathing. 67% were sleeping on a surface not designed for infant sleep. Um, and included in that category is the couch, the chair, falling asleep with a parent, um, falling asleep in the car seat and not being moved to uh, an, a, a sleep environment that was created for sleep, um, including rockers and bouncers. And then 50% of the infants um, were sharing a sleep surface at the time of their death all of which um, are modifiable risk factors along with our smoking and smoke exposure that really um, increase the risk of our infants dying from, from suid. So we take all of these data, um, myself and my um, colleague, Emily Farrell, who is my epidemiology on this grant, epidemiologist. Um, and this is what we've learned in the state of Kentucky. Smoke exposure during or after, and it doesn't matter the amount of smoke exposure. And I can't say that enough because that's also shown in the national literature, doubles the risk of suid. That is insane. And, you know, I, that's gonna, gonna be one of my main messages today um, to please um, stop smoking before pregnancy and do not expose infants to smoke either in the home or in the car um, after birth. What we also learned was that for every week older gestationally the infant was at birth, a ten, they, we saw a 10% decrease in the risk of SIDS, in the likelihood of SIDS. So we have um, appealed to a lot of our um, medical colleagues to say this preterm um, delivery, we really want to see the infant go to 40 weeks if at all possible because it, um, it goes a long way in decreasing the risk of SIDS. And then obviously um, unsafe sleep practices. Um, and I will add here that in, um, in our data, 93.5% of our suicide cases had at least one unsafe, unsafe sleep factor present at the time of death. And usually there were multiple um, risk factors present at the time of death. But there's some good news. Um, what we've also seen in our Kentucky data is that breastfeeding reduces the risk of suid by 35%. And in some of the studies that I've seen nationally, it has reduced the risk by up to 50%. Now it doesn't have to be um, that, that it can be pumped uh, breast milk, but infants that are fed breast milk, we can see a reduction of the risk of suid by 35%. Pacifier use is also seen to reduce the risk of SIDS. The data on this is variable um, depending on what study that you read, but uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, along with the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes for um, Health and Human Development, all recommend um, offering a pacifier for infants once breastfeeding has been established as a protective measure against um, suid. And then lastly, following safe sleep practices um, will go a long way in reducing your infant's uh, risk for SIDS. So Kentucky's um, the cornerstone of prevention for um, SIDS and SUID and undetermined causes of death is our safe sleep campaign. Um, and that is built on the ABCDs of safe sleep so that we place children alone on their back in their crib for every sleep and that caregivers are um, aware and not impaired while caregiving for an infant. Now this safe sleep campaign began back in 2015 
And it was actually a recommendation for those of you that are aware of the external child fatality review panel that was commissioned by the governor and then subsequently put into law. That panel made that recommendation in 2014 because they were seeing a lot of deaths of children, infants, where there were a lot of unsafe sleep factors present. And so in the fall of 2015, Kentucky um, sent out surveys. We showed up at the state fair and did surveys. We set up a safe sleep um, environment and we asked folks to tell us what was safe sleep and what wasn't. And after we took all that data back and looked at it, we realized that while other states um, had the ABCs of safe sleep, Kentucky really needed to add a D for danger. We were getting a lot of information that caregivers did not understand the dangers of being impaired while caregiving or caretaking. Um, and so we all got together with a multitude of focus groups and came up with the D that stands for um, be aware, not impaired. Um, and actually, since I've taken this position back in 2016, I've had about four different states reach out to me and ask if they could borrow our D because they're seeing um, parents with the increased use of opioids and with other um, over-the-counter medications to help folks sleep, um, that they've seen an increase in um, impaired caregivers at the time of their sewer deaths, and they wanted to incorporate that into their safe sleep messaging. So that was really exciting for us. So let's take a deeper look at the, um, the ABCDs as they stand. So um, babies should always sleep alone and every sleep time counts. Um, we do have, um, I've been asked a lot of the times, um, is it okay for them to sleep, you know, with me when they're taking the nap? Um, and we stand by the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations, which is every sleep time counts. Um, so they should always sleep alone. And that includes not with their twin um, or any pets or anything. It, sh it should always be the baby alone. Um, and so we like to say that the only thing uh, in a baby sleep space is the baby. Now I will say um, that a pacifier is permissible. And as I mentioned earlier, since it's a protective factor, it is encouraged. Um, but we've seen a lot of folks that like to attach the pacifiers to a cord, um, you know, like to buy a little clip or um, I've also seen these pacifiers that have a stuffed animal attached to the end of the pacifier. Um, and I understand it's a way of keeping track of it. But we have seen in our sewage registry already at least one of the cases where um, an infant was in an otherwise pristine sleep environment, but had that, um, I think it was a, a stuffed animal that was stuck to the end of the pacifier that had smushed into the baby's nose and airway and suffocated the infant during sleep. Um, and so the pacifiers that we recommend um, and that also um, the AAPA recommends, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, is one that's made out of a single molded plastic um, that is breathable, but that also um, can't come apart, loose things can't fall off, um, and pose a risk of suffocation for infants. The second piece, piece to the ABCDs is that the, um, the AAP recommends sharing your room with your baby, ideally for the first year of life, and it's actually shown in the data to reduce the risk of SIDS by as much as 50%. Um, what we're knowing and what we're learning is that it's, um, it's much easier to feed and comfort your baby and hear your baby when they're moving around at night. Um, and so we talk about that, you know, ideally it's the first year of life. Some parents um, like to move their infant into their own nursery at around six months, but we recommend the first year. We also know that um, Swaddling has been shown when done correctly um, to calm a fussy infant. And obviously parents are exhausted of newborns. It seems like when you have your baby, you're never ever gonna get a good night's sleep again. And so if, you know, if swaddling is shown to calm your fussy baby, definitely use that as a tool and technique. But if you plan to swaddle, 
there are some tips that you should follow. And um, I'll put both of my little bullet points about swaddling up so you can read along with me, but always place your swaddled infant on their back. You should stop swaddling when an infant is trying to roll over or if the infant can kick or move their arms to loosen the swaddle. Um, I was chatting with one mom who said that she was, she really wanted to swaddle her daughter because she was very fussy. She had colic um, and, and it was a very, um, very stressful time in their lives, but her daughter could wiggle her arms out of the swaddling. Um, and she said she watched videos and, um, you know, did it right by the book. Um, and so, you know, we talked about the fact that if the infant can loosen the swaddle, it is at risk of creating um, soft material in the sleep area and therefore poses a risk of suffocation for the infant. And so um, we recommended in that particular case that she not swaddle her infant. So our takeaway when we're talking with parents is share the room, not the bed. Um, and I've tried in my, um, in my work in safe sleep since I took this position on in 2016 to um, not just put moms in there, you know, we want dads in there, we want grandparents in there, we want everybody to know <clears throat> that you should share the room with your baby, but not the bed or not this safe, not the sleep surface. <clears throat> Excuse me. So back sleeping on their back, um, it was the first major change nationally to prevent um, SIDS and it was being recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics back in 1992. And it continues to be the cornerstone of safe sleep. Um, until their first birthday, infants should sleep on their back. And what we know, and that's for nighttime and naps, um, and what we're learning is that um, Folks that study safe sleep up at the CDC and at HRSA have identified two um, states of sleep for infants. And those are quiet sleep, which is the very, very deep sleep um, when it's very difficult to arouse an infant. And then active sleep where the infant is daydreaming. <clears throat> and what they show is that infants that sleep on their stomach get into and sleep longer in that very deep state of sleep. And it is, it is more difficult to arouse them, to wake them up. And that is one of the primary reasons that we're learning now that if they do get into, if the infant does get into a situation where they're having a hard time breathing or the oxygen exchange is not um, positive in their sleep environment, that they can suffocate and they, they can't um, sometimes arouse themselves from sleep. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that we talk about um, that they need to sleep on their back. And I've had a lot of parents say, you know, my infant sleeps better on their stomach. Um, and what all of the experts at the American Academy of Pediatrics are saying is that better isn't always, or longer and deeper isn't always better. You want your infant to be able to arouse themselves if they get into a situation where um, they're having a difficult time breathing. We also like to emphasize um, that folks never use a sleep positioner such as a wedge or a rolled up blanket or pillow to maintain a sideline or a propped up sleep position or to prop up a bottle um, while, they're, while the infant is in um, their sleep environment. It absolutely increases the risk of suffocation. And we advise that um, like I've said, if only a baby sleeping on their back in their crib is, is the pristine sleep environment that we recommend. It's just some statistics. Um, babies who are sleeping, used to sleeping on their backs, but are, um, that are placed to sleep on their stomach are at very high risk for SIDS. The risk goes up about to 75%. So that is, would be a circumstance where I would say, make sure that you're talking to your infant's caregivers, a babysitter or grandparent or relative, anyone that is um, caring for your infant while you are away, make sure they understand that your infant sleeps on its back and it sleeps there for every sleep, regardless of if it's just a 15 minute nap. 
I get a lot of questions um, about if the baby rolls over on his own during sleep, his or her own, do I need to reposition the baby? So the guidance is if your infant can roll front to back and back to front, there is no need to reposition your baby while your baby is sleeping. So just a little clip from our developmental timeline of babies. What we know is that babies usually start rolling from their tummy to their back first. And that um, occurs in the ballpark in the range of about four months. They can roll from their back to their tummy between five and six months. And they should be rolling both directions by around seven months. Um, so use that, you know, obviously that's general um, baby development. So if your infant was born prematurely or if your infant is progressing um, ahead of the curve, um, just take that into consideration when you're thinking about whether or not you need to roll your infant back over while they're sleeping on their own in their crib. I also have had some parents um, um, really show concern about their infants aspirating um, while they're on their on their back. Um, and so the the NICHD back in 2014 um, at the request of states, because we were getting a lot of, um, you know, and my mother, I, my infant was born in 1995 and um, that was right on the leading edge of uh, back to sleep campaign from the, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics. But um, they gave us this nice um, picture that we can share with parents where you can see that the windpipe and the esophagus, you can see their position. You can see that easily um, an infant that's placed on their back, um, it's less likely that the um, anything that's regurgitated, spit up or whatever would have a more difficult time getting into the windpipe just based on anatomy alone. So we say that um, it's important to just use all the tools you have at your disposal when you're educating parents um, and understanding and validating their concerns and their worry um, because every great parent wants their, you know, wants just to reduce all the risks for their baby. But just as we learn more about what is risky behavior, sharing that with folks to educate them. RC stands for clean, clear crib. Um, and the safest crib contains nothing but a baby sleeping on his or her back on a firm mattress with a tightly fitting sheet. So I want to talk a little bit about the firmness of the mattress. Um, this is something that has recently been, um, since I've joined the Safe Sleep Conversations in 2016, um, it's been in a lot of the discussions that I've been present for both in the state, but as well as when I go to conferences um, nationally um, for my sewage grant. And we've had the discussion of what is a firm mattress. Um, and so in order to test the firmness of a mattress, um, we say that you should press down on the sides and the middle with your hand. The mattress should not conform and should rapidly spring back. Um, and our rule of thumb for parents and caregivers is that if it feels comfortable to an adult, it's probably not likely firm enough for an infant. Um, I have had a lot of moms um, say, that especially when they are utilizing a pack and play um, as their crib, as their safe sleep environment, that that pad that's in there that's sort of like the little mattress for the pack and play is basically, it feels like a rock. It's really hard cardboard or whatever. I'm not sure what it's made of, but um, that they, you know, really feel like that that's, you know, that could hurt their baby or bruise their baby. And we advise them that absolutely rest assured that it is what your baby needs, what their, their bones and spines need support that um, our adult bones do not need. And so we really um, stress, don't, don't place a blanket underneath the crib sheet of the pack and play to make sure that your um, sleep environment is what you would consider soft enough or comfortable for your infant. An emphasis is often placed, and that was kind of the point that I was making just now, um, on the avoidance of soft bedding that might cover the infant's face, but it's equally as important not to place any bedding underneath the sleeping um, infant. 
what we have seen um, also with the pack and plays that I'll emphasize here is that um, it's important to use the mattress that came with the sleep um, environment that you're using. So if you're using a crib um, or a pack and play or um, a bassinet, our rule is that if you can get more than two fingers, two, um, an index and a middle finger in between the mattress and the side of the crib or pack and play or bassinet, that is not um, the, the mattress that should be used with that. We've seen, um, we've had several cases in our registry of infants who were old enough to flip over, get wedged between in the gap, that two inch gap, um, between the, well, and it would actually just be probably a one inch or one and a half inch, but a two, the two finger gap. Um, we've seen them get wedged in there and because their head is so large and their neck muscles are weak, they were not able to get out of that environment and they ended up suffocating um, because they were stuck in that environment. Also, um, the latest crib standards, and this is something that I did not know about um, coming into this position. So um, I've made it a point to make sure that all my friends and family members know um, that the latest crib standards um, eliminated the drop down sides. And those were eliminated because they were associated with many injuries from entrapment. Um, and so the Consumer Product Safety Commission advises that using a pre-2011 crib is not safe. Now, I like a good bargain and I love, you know, sort of the old farmhouse look, um, but I did tell all of my friends that, you know, like that same sort of style of decorating that you can absolutely not do that. Do not go to a, a resale shop or a consignment shop and buy a pre-2011 crib um, for your infant. And if you do go to those places and buy a bassinet, discard all of the frilly, um, fluffy stuff that comes along with it. Um, those are absolutely um, just a suffocation hazard for infants. If you are concerned about it, whether or not your crib's um, construction meets this, the safety standards, you can always go to the Consumer Product Safety Commission's website and they have a specific um, page dedicated to safe to sleep and it's their crib information center. This is where they also uh, post um, product recalls. So if you all will remember um, early in uh, 2019 and maybe even late 2018, um, the rock and plays were recalled and I could be getting my dates wrong um, with this year. I, sometimes I don't even remember what year I'm in. So it might have been that that was that was late 2019 and early 2020, which actually sounds um, more correct um, in retrospect. But in any case, you can go there if you're ever interested to know if a product that you're um, interested in purchasing for yourself or a loved one or for loved one um, you see on Facebook that they're using a particular um, product, you can go there to check to see if it has been recalled or if there are any um, concerns about the placing an infant in um, that specific device. I do want to say a little bit about um, the inclined infant sleep position right here. Um, back, and I do believe it was at the beginning of this year, um, we had several um, recalls for the rock and play. And as a result of that, the Consumer Product Safety Commission authorized a study to be done um, to really look at what was going on when an infant's head was um, at a higher um, angle than their feet. And so they commissioned Erin Mannon, who is a PhD mechanical engineer out at the University of Arkansas, to evaluate how babies move and use their muscles when they're in inclined sleep devices. So um, this and I can um, you, I'll have my contact information at the end of this slide. So I mean, at the end of the presentation. So if anyone is interested in um, knowing, you know, more or want to read the whole um, entire study, I can give that to you. But basically, um, what the results were were that the um, when a baby was placed um, with its head higher than its legs, it was more difficult for the infant to get out of that sleep position. And so um, they, would get they would get frustrated and frustrated 
and they would get fatigued quickly. Um, and so it, it could lead to, to suffocation. Now I have to advise you <clears throat> that no infants were harmed um, at all, obviously during um, this study, but basically she had sensors on them and was, she was really taking a look at um, how they were struggling. And again, it's the size of their head and, the, and their neck muscles as it relates to their rest of their body, how they can use the rest of their body. So um, our bottom line on that is that the safest position for an infant to sleep is on their back on a firm, flat surface for every sleep. And I just took a look at my time. So I'm going to move a little bit quicker through the rest of these um, in an opportunity to keep everything going on track. So real quickly, um, infants who were born to mother, mothers that smoked were twice as likely to die from a sleep related death. Um, and that includes um, exposure to passive smoke in the household. It also doubles an infant's risk for steward. Um, and so what we're learning about that is that prenatal exposures, not just to um, cigarettes, but to alcohol as well, um, have a direct effect on the neurotransmitter systems that are really critical to the developing human brain. And when an infant um, in that critical stage of development that we talked about a minute ago, um, when they're in that critical stage of development and their heart rate and their respirations aren't stable every single day, and you know this when you watch an infant breathe, that sometimes they'll have rapid breathing, sometimes their, uh, their pulse rates and their, and their heart rates will go really up, those fluctuate as they're growing and developing. And that does, that's not restricted just to when they're awake. That absolutely happens when they're asleep. And so what we're starting to learn is that infants in um, that critical period of development, when there's a lot of fluctuation from that, if they were exposed to alcohol or cigarette smoke, can have a reduction in the neurotransmitters that arouse them, that are like the, the brain waking you up um, while you're sleeping, that you know happens to all of us. So um, that's um, some of that literature is out there and I can share um, what I have, but definitely um, we wanna uh, make sure that folks know that it's not just um, that it, you know, can have an effect on you if you're drinking or using alcohol and drugs after the pregnancy, but definitely um, in utero as well. Um, we also know that infants born to mothers who smoke during pregnancy were twice as, oh, I already said all that. I thought I clicked my button, sorry. Um, just some notes on distraction. Um, and I'll just give you some takeaways that handheld technology, you know, it gets us through our day, especially with coronavirus this year, we've had to rely on technology, but it also takes away from monitoring infants when they're in, um, not, you know, when they're awake, but perhaps not in a safe sleep situation and they maybe fall asleep. So for example, if your infant is enjoying some time in a boppy pillow, it could easily um, fall asleep. Um, and if you are busy looking at your phone or perhaps it's a babysitter and she's busy, you know, looking at her phone or checking work or checking school, um, it doesn't take long at all for an infant to slide down in those um, and for an unsafe sleep circumstance to be um, created. So we just say um, that it's really important to have eyes on your infant anytime that um, it could potentially be. Um, sleeping and make sure that there's no soft materials or anything like that that's in the environment that the infant could come in contact with. So our takeaway there is be aware, not impaired, and put down your phone. Um, so really quickly, some things to remember. Um, don't overheat your baby. Um, if you're comfortable in light clothing, the baby will be too. Um, so keep your room temperature at a comfortable setting for you. If your baby does require an extra layer for warmth, try layers. Um, our rule of thumb, if you're going to layer your infant, is to layer them in one la a layer more than you have on. Um, and blankets, don't use blankets for warmth. Just, you know, use a onesie underneath a sleeper. Um, we also know, and this was published in the uh, May 5th uh, version of the journal Pediatrics, that tummy time every day um, helps infants and it, um, it, infants that get at least 30 minutes of tummy time every day over a 24 hour period um, have impos positive health outcomes are associated with those. Um, they have better gross motor development. They have decreased body index, mass index. 
Um, so there are lots of good things associated in addition to strengthening their neck muscles. Um, so it's really important to get that tummy time every day so that your baby can crawl and do all the things that um, babies need to do to stay on track development, developmentally. Safe sleep during COVID, um, I'm not gonna go through this, but basically um, any child under the age of two should not wear a face covering. It definitely inhibits their ability to um, get the oxygen that they need. Um, and then I just wanna really quickly share some resources. Um, we have a Facebook page where um, about once a week, I post um, different sorts of things on Facebook. Um, so we're Safe Sleep KY, you can see there. We also have a website um, where I post data and statistics and current research. And also that's where you can get some handouts um, if you're interested in downloading um, and you can download that those as a care provider, as a parent, as a community service agency. You know, there are lots of different things out there. And then also, this is a really cool tool that um, I've been using a lot during COVID, but it's, um, and it was developed by the NICHD, the National Institutes for um, Health and Development, and it's a virtual nursery. And so basically, um, when you go into the nursery, you can click on the different icons and it will give you the same tips that um, we've talked about today during this discussion about ways to keep your infant safe um, and and that's everything from how while you're breastfeeding to the temperature in your home. Um, so that's a really um, unique and cool thing that they've done. And then also um, here are some resources um, and I'm sure that my slides will be available. Um, I also wanna just say that there was a recent book published um, by um, Springer and it's the in Infant Safe Sleep and it's a pocket guide for clinicians. It was edited by Rachel Moon, who is from the University of Virginia, and she advises the CDC on much of their um, the safe sleep uh, recommendations that they put out. This um, this new uh, pocket guide has a lot of additional um, information for infants that have um, other health conditions where. Um, uh, practitioners may be concerned about safe sleep for infants with different things. So I would recommend you checking it out if you have time. Um, and there's my contact information if you're interested in reaching out or if you've got any questions from this presentation. I really appreciate the opportunity to share, um, share this with you today. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Tina. I really appreciate you being with us. Um, I think we had a question that was answered. And then another question was related to uh, a resident who suggested that where they went to medical school, there was an incentive for parents to quit smoking. Um, if they quit smoking, they would be provided with a year of diapers if they quit while pregnant. Does Kentucky have something similar? We do not. Um, right now, um, we have our sewage grant um, doesn't have, so it basically is just a research funding grant, right? But what we do have in the state of Kentucky are um, packages, maternal and child health packages that we offer for every single um, local health department. And the local health departments take those and they do like lo local um, advocacy and training. So I will put this out on the next listserv um, conversation that we have. That's a great suggestion. I love it. Um, and I'll reach out to the local health departments and see how we can um, use creative ideas like that to increase, um, well, to decrease smoking. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Okay. And I'll just ask Erin's question, um, which I think was answered. Um, Dr. Frazier had a mom tell her that a lactation consultant told her that letting her one month old sleep for more than four hours would put the baby at risk of SIDS because the baby would be in too much of a deep sleep. And she had never heard of this before and was concerned about that information from a, a, another professional uh, taking care of children. So. We, we have not um, had any guidance of that nature at all. And now I will say that, um, and I didn't say this in the presentation, so I appreciate you giving me just a second to mention it. Um, we haven't heard that, so no. Um, and I, I am with the CDC weekly. I will shoot that up to my project officer just to see if she has any additional information, but I've never heard that. What I will say, though, is um, the literature talks about when an infant is in that REM sleep, and, and it's the more awake sleep, which is um, produced when they're in a car seat. A lot of people worry about, you know, 
your baby will go to sleep really quickly in their car seat in the car. And should I be worried? No, because the jiggling of the car keeps them from falling into that very deep sleep. But when the jiggling stops, they can go into that really deep sleep. Um, and if they're in that incline that the car seat provides, that produces um, a likelihood that they could smush down in the car seat and suffocate, but also um, that they couldn't arouse if that happened. So um, I, I meant to mention that, but I was kind of trying to monitor my time. Um, but it um, definitely, I will reach out and um, Dr. Doc, if I get any feedback that, that that don't let your baby sleep for more than four hours is, anything that the CDC or the American Academy of Pediatrics is saying, I'll definitely let you know and you can shoot that out to the group, to all the participants. Great, well, thank you so much again for joining us and sharing this really important information. I think all of us as um, um, in the work that we do and in interacting with children and families, I'm always reminded that I can personally do a better job of reinforcing that safe sleep environment when I see things going on you know, I personally work in the hospital and sometimes there are things that I can address in the room to reinforce those A, B, C, and even Ds. So thank you. Thank so you we'll move so on, much. we'll take, yeah, we'll take a five minute break um, and then we'll be back with the next talk. Thank you.